This is the story of innovation and abandonment. This is the story of Chicago's lost L lines. From the days of horse-drawn carriage to the modern era of cars and buses, Chicago has always been on America's cutting edge of transportation, ultimately adopting the train for the sake of rapid transit. However, this advancement was not without challenges, as Chicago suffered a dark age of sorts, where parts of its system would fall into despair, lost into the endless march of time. The remnants of the train's darkest hour are still present today. You just have to know where to look. Yerkes still had designs for more elevated railroads, such as the Union Elevated Railroad, or as Chicagoans would take to calling it, the Union Loop. A single terminal completed in 1897 would connect all four of the other L's. This way, commuters downtown would no longer have to walk around and make additional connections. The other L's used this loop, abandoning their independent terminals. Unity was furthered in 1911, when they were brought together under the Chicago Elevated Railways Collateral Trust, which in 1913 fully connected the four L routes, introducing unification in routing and transfers. With the loop finally being completed, the transit system would, at least from the outside, remain unchanged for the next 60 years. However, the benefits for the average Chicagoan would only continue to increase. Throughout that period, the L would make some of its highest quality improvements, many of which remain in place today. Yerkers had constantly advocated for the unification of the elevated railroad companies, and it was something he had attempted many times. By 1911, the Elevated Railway Collateral Trust, or CER, had been established, financially bringing the companies together. But at this point, Yerkers played no part in the establishment due to the fiasco of the Northwestern L's botched opening, forcing him to leave town. In his absence, the trust was headed mainly by one Samuel Insel, whose specialty was in utilities, but he had also taken interest in transportation. The CER would oversee its first cross-city trips in 1913, going from Jackson Park on the south side to Wilmette's Linden Avenue. Trips from Ravenswood to Kenwood began the same year, as did Wilson Avenue to Inglewood Express. The CER also oversaw universal transfers so that switching from one L line to another would come without any additional fees. And so the Lake Street transfer station was opened, fully connecting the Met and the Lake Street L, allowing for simple transfer at Lake and Paulina Street where the L's met. Sam Insel would also introduce the Chicago, North Shore, and Milwaukee lines into the loop since he owned all three. Without making a single transfer, one could now board a train in downtown Chicago and ride all the way to Milwaukee, Wisconsin. The CER had helped, but for the sake of their longevity, they would need to be fully and officially unified. Thus, in 1924, under the oversight of Insul, the Chicago Rapid Transit Company, or CRT, was established, bringing the Chicago L's under one administration and allowing for their continued growth. For example, the North Shore Line, yet another line owned by Insul, got an extension to Niles Center, eventually operating from Howard Street to Dempster and Niles Center, with seven stops along the way. This was also extended to the Garfield Park Line, which would carry trains to the far western suburb of Westchester, and eventually stop at Manaheim in 22nd when the terminal was finished in 1930. At its height, the L had 227.49 miles of track and carried an average of 627,157 people every weekday, thanks to its 5,306 trains visiting 227 stations in the Chicago metropolitan area alone. But from here, things started to decline. All was not well with Chicago's public transportation system. Many issues were developing by the mid-1940s, chief among them, of course, being on profitability. At this point, the street railway system was being managed by the Chicago surface lines, but was still made up of five separate companies. The Chicago Railways Company, the Chicago City Railway Company, the Calumet and South Chicago Railway Company, the Chicago and Western Railway Company, and the Southern Street Railway Company. These entities, in the face of bankruptcy, concluded that something major needed to be done. So the Chicago Rapid Transit Company would eventually step in, consolidating everything under one name. Well, formally two, but the other, the Union Consolidated Elevated Railway Company, only had a few miles of track with no rolling stock 
so the CRT took most of it. Furthermore, around this time growth slowed due to the lack of funds brought on by the Great Depression and wartime rationing. Reinvestment became extremely difficult, if not impossible. The growth of the CRT ground to a halt in 1930. From then on, there would be no more stations or tracks built. Ironically, it seemed that with every dollar that didn't go into the system, another person would board a train. Hundreds of thousands of people would be added to circulation. And with the lack of finance, sooner or later the system would literally fall apart if new measures were not taken. Basically, the city needed to play a stronger hand. The CRT made it a point to never abandon a line or even close a single station. And the CTA had no such misgivings. Upon surveying every line and station, they went on to close anything that didn't turn a profit. They closed 10 low-use stations and cut the lake line down to just Market Street, discontinuing everything outside the loop. Several other lines would be similarly streamlined. On March the 27th, 1948, the Skokie Line service would be replaced by buses, as would the Westchester branch on December the 9th, 1951. And I'm sure you're curious what happened to all those lines that were swapped out with buses. Many of these lines were demolished as the CTA moved to erase them from the city, destroying their supporting physical infrastructure in the process. The demolition was so effective that to see where the tracks were, you almost have to look for unexplained blank spaces throughout the city. Elements such as scraps of a foundation or an outline in an alley suggesting where a massive rail line once stood do remain to this day. One of the lines sentenced to be scrapped in specific was the Met. The Logan Square branch of the Met was demolished in 1964, years after being abandoned. Its arches and supports still tower over the roads and some buildings of Chicago. Graffiti can even be spotted on the I-beams that hold it up. Other views of the Met are more subtle, only visible in back alleys and hidden behind buildings. Other lines would not leave such obvious remains. The westbound stockyard branch that once ran over Chicago's meatpacking district was thoroughly erased. When the CTA discontinued service, they demolished it completely. For a time, there were some grinders visible, but they have also vanished as the space was needed for roads and buildings. Another lost terminal of the 1950s was the Wall Street Terminal. The place where it once stood and served the L is now a parking garage. The only thing left is the Franklin Street substation, which now provides power to the loop instead of the station. 